Good morning. This is Plan to Win with Mark Henderson Leary and a good friend Brad Fryer. Like they throw you off with it with with the bringing it down. Yeah, you cut you you threw me a curveball. I, I, I thought I paused I, it's, and waited some, on it, and I, I watched just it go fe- by. It just suddenly felt trite. It felt like oh, so <laughs> so predictable. But you understand it that every Monday morning I look forward to that because that's my that's my punch in the arm to get the uh, the morning started. So well, let's get this going. It's rock and roll time, Brad Fryer. What do you <laughs> got for me? Let's. What do you got? Uh, yeah, what's in your mind? Uh, what's on your mind? We're, we were talking about kids and college and all that kind of stuff. What's but what's what's on your what's really on your mind? Yeah, man. So I yeah moved uh moved my oldest daughter and our first daughter leaving the nest. Uh, moved her into her dorm this this past weekend, and uh, it was it was everything you would uh, would imagine it being um, exciting and and scary and emotionally and mentally and physically exhausting. And uh, so yeah, so she's uh. She is kicking off her her college endeavors uh, like, uh, this week, I guess. So when is it, when's the first day of school? So rushes this week, and then class starts next Monday. Okay, so yeah, yeah that well rushes intense. Is she is she rushing or what she, are you that? She, she is. She was she was not sure if she wanted to, and you know we just kind of said do what you want to do. If, you know if you want to go through rush and not join one, that's fine too. But you know she's she has little to no experience with that that whole world um and so she's kind of going in wise uh, eyes wide open okay yeah my daughter went through that and it ultimately dropped it out for because for a lot of reasons i think in covid time it wasn't it wasn't the benefit it had been before that but i think maybe some of that's coming back yeah 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 it's, it's certainly it's going to be different i mean part of their part of the rush process is is virtual and that's going to make it challenging I mean, how do wow. you get a feel for people and different houses if uh if you're not doing it in person. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. You know, obviously um, our, our, our work here is done uh, for the most part, all the, all the, all the programming that, uh, that hopefully we've supported along the way is, uh, is in effect. And she's, uh, you know, she's got to make her decisions now. So you, you said something that inspired me a little bit because I do, I, I agree. I don't disagree with what you said about our work is done in terms of the feeling of like, I've, I have, we've, we've put the boat in the water, <laughs> you know, it's like now, and now is not the time to worry about leaks. <laughs> you know, we, we, should, <laughs> we should have gotten that part figured out. Yeah. And, and so there, I had that the definitely the uh, inventory of parenting skills feeling of like, okay, top to bottom, did I do it all? And I was like, whoa, yeah. I did not, uh, but I, hopefully this is enough. And so I, I, I think it's certainly a new chapter. But what I have discovered since then is that uh, there is an opportunity to check out as a parent and feel like it's 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 over, or even the transition into. I mean, I think probably a lot of parents. It looks to me like a lot of parents begin the checkout process over the next five to six years of like, how do I get this my payroll reduced? <laughs> how do I how do I get into a new tax bracket in the right ways and uh, yeah. and 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 kind of get that my life back into empty nest that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But I've also discovered uh, as what could have been working towards an empty nester and having uh, a three year old, like a twenty year old and three year old, which has really made my um, parenting perspective have to mm-hmm. re-up. re up. Yeah. Uh, but I have found so I've, I've tapped into a new gear of parenting with my daughter as she's getting older, and that meaning I had to I had to really rethink what it is to parent and, and level up and be a leader. And so I guess just maybe bear that in mind that, that you get another shot at this, <laughs> the language changes and, and I'm, I'm feeling grateful that to, to be able to, to parent and teach and mentor my daughter at age 20 in ways yeah. that I didn't before. And it, and it is challenging. It's, it's challenging in whole new ways. I have to really rethink everything I do and I think that applies to leadership, I and mean, maybe that's the tie back here. That if you if you train a, a call center uh, rep to handle phone calls, that doesn't mean uh, your that's that's your leadership and management style. You may have to level up your leadership and management and coaching. No, I mean I totally agree. You know, there's so many lessons. So I, I wrote my daughter a note and left it on, left it under her pillow as I as we left yesterday, so that she would find it last night. But there was a lot of lessons that that I that I wrote out in the note, you know, just you know, wishing her good luck and telling her, you know, hopefully these are the things that you remember. And so much of the stuff that was embedded in that note was actually stuff that we teach leaders of organizations and and top performing salespeople. Uh, you know, it's it's 
it, it transcends um, all aspects of life. It's not just, you know, hey, how to be a good person, but, you know, how to communicate with other people and how to understand, you know, who you are and your value and, um, you know, how not to judge others. And, you know, I mean, one, one of the biggest lessons that I, that I continue to try to reinforce, and it's something that we talk in sales all the time about, but it's, you know, don't, don't judge people based on their words, judge them based on their actions, right? Because people will say a lot of, a lot of things, but their actions are more telling. And, you know, and I tell salespeople all the time, well, you know, I know the prospect said this, but what are they doing? <laughs> yeah. Because they'll tell, they'll tell you looks good, sounds good, but it's their actions that really um, predict the future. And so, yeah, yeah. With, you know, with my daughter, I tell her, tell, tell them all the time, you know, Hey, w- with boys or with girlfriends, you know, if, um, pay attention to their actions, you know, they can tell you what they want when they're face to face, but it's how they, it's how they behave. And, and, uh, that, that really is telling. Well, so the, the parallels here are super solid. So we're, we've got a lot of material here. <laughs> Thanks for teeing yeah. that up. Yeah. Cause I, I, I think that, uh, I've had the same thing with my daughter and, and it is finding roommates, for example, and finding people to hang out with. And, and mm-hmm. I, I, I gained that deeper awareness of this, but going into this, be cautious of people who are, who are very uh, exuberant about claiming to share the same values as you, like eating healthy and discipline, because they might be trying to talk themselves into something that they're not good at yet, which is fine if, if you know, I, everybody has to kind of level up if they want to get what they want. But some, sometimes people are nowhere near <laughs> where they say they are. Yeah. And so really- Probably like, more often than not. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, you know, looking for hang- roommates and people are going to spend time with. I, I mean, I had this exact conversation with her last week. You know, look at their lifestyle. What time do they get up? What, how time? How many times do they stay up past ten or eleven? You know, and so she's got a friend who goes to bed at like eight or nine. In you know, in college, it's pretty rare. And she's like, I need to hang out with her. I'm like, Yeah, you do. I, say, I can be a friend with the person that does that. That's my, that's my <laughs> yeah. speed. And so you watch for these people who who like you know they 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 minimize their commitment to discipline, but they clearly are very disciplined. And there are people mm-hmm. who maximize their ostensible uh, commitment to, uh, to discipline, but, but they don't do it. And they're, they're constantly yeah. hey, healthy food eating, you know, and it's French fries three times a week. Yeah. And so you have to watch for the difference. And, and I think where that comes back in leadership is we do a lot of work to build a culture and, and set a an, set of objectives and missions for, for our organization, our, our, our core focus and our purpose and the things we do. And it's the start of the conversation is, you know, do you seem to have evidence to that that's you? Do you like that? And, and I think but in the interview process, sometimes we're having to assess that whether the evidence in the past was there. And sometimes it's hard to prove that it actually was there. It just looks like it might have been there. And that's the start of the conversation. Do you have the shame, the same kind of values that we do in the culture of the core values? And that's great. But it doesn't stop there. <laughs> you have to watch the results. And if the results aren't there, you have to make a change. And that is that is hard for college students. My daughter struggled and struggles with that still, but she's very committed. She's been burned very badly. And so she now understands the consequences of letting thing, letting results that don't turn out, <laughs> sit around too much. You have to make changes uh, yeah. but in business and leadership. You know, if you've got, if you've got that leader who is claims to be a head of finance and, and understand this, but isn't producing the things, or if you've got a head of sales, who's not doing that or a head of opera, it doesn't matter any functional thing. You've got somebody who claims and you, and you connect with on the, on the purpose. But if, if the actions are not there, you are going to have to make some kind of change yeah well and you know and that <laughs> I, I see this just continuing to unfold because even to that point you know if you're a leader who's trying to create a culture um there's a lot of leaders who who try to create a culture by by preaching right right but here here's who we are here's what we believe you know um you know judge people by their intent not by their actions you know you know and they they they, they preach from the pulpit but then they're hypocrites yeah right? They don't, they don't walk the walk or, you know, they read a book, they find something new and exciting and they pivot all the time. Um, you know, as, as, as someone who is a leader or someone who wants to be a leader, um, you know, find, find that thing that, that is comfortable for you. Right. You know, find that culture, that belief system, that, uh, that cadence that's good for you as a leader because if you're if if you're not consistent with your messaging and your behaviors, then you become a hypocrite. Right? Yeah. 
and and your team will see through it. You know, they'll they'll identify it that it you know well you know he's he's talking about accountability, but he doesn't hold himself accountable, or he yeah. talks about you know um, um, uh, you know the integrity of of respecting each other's time, but he's always late to meetings. Um, you know, you've got to find you've got to be a person who leads by example and leads from the front. And we talked about this last week, son, right? You know, leading from the front versus leading from the back. For sure. Well, one of the things in early in the process I teach people is that you got to have a handful of rules. And this is based on the, the parenting methodology of parent, parenting effectiveness training, which is the handful of rules. It means a small number of rules that you have to repeat often and you mm-hmm. have to walk the talk. You have to actually exhibit them. And, and I really say, you know, you want a small number of rules because it's hard for your culture and your, and your folks, which it ends up being your core values, right? So if you've got three to five core values, hopefully closer to three, I mean, you can have as many as seven or eight in certain cases, but it's very, very difficult to manage. So I definitely recommend between three and five to make it really useful and actionable if you can get there. And that's that's about all your folks can remember and handle. It's it, more than that, and it's too difficult to know what's important. But there's a second point to that. It's like, you are you're you don't need that many rules. You can't handle that many rules. It's going to be tough for you to be able to, to be in integrity with those things. And I think that this, this actually gets a little bit deep in that what I've found is if you if you build the culture like you want it to, and it's, and it's in your likeness as a visionary entrepreneur, you are likely to have two potentially tricky, truly core values. And, and this is super subtle. I don't teach this very often because it can get really confusing. But one of the core values thing, it, it could be based on bad behavior that you're trying to justify, right? So, so like so sometimes people like firefighting, that. Yeah. firefighting cultures. Oh, we're, you know, we rush to action around here. Okay. Yeah. Let's be careful. <laughs> Let's make yeah. sure rushing to action is not always maximum distraction, m- wasteful effort. And so if there's something that's truthful in that you, you do need to package it, but make sure you're not justifying bad, expensive behavior that, that really causes problems. Uh, and then the flip side of that is actually, this is the, this is where I think you really level up. And this is really hard to do. And that is that if it's truly valuable to it's a it's a core value and it really is core, you really understand it, it might not be something you're perfect at. It might be it has to be true. It has to be true enough that's evident. You really have to value it. But but good entre- good visionaries get distracted and I have mm-hmm. core values that you know, like really spending time on what matters most. That's a core value to me. Part of why that frustrates me is that when I don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> and so well, I mean, is there anybody but is there anybody that's perfect at anything though? Well, see, that's where I'm going with this. A lot of yeah. leaders think they are, right? So if you put it, if you put a, a core value that's truly core that you're not perfect at, it's important to understand that the lens is back on you, and you mm-hmm. may have to, you might have mea culpa. You might have to say, "Hey, I wasn't perfect. Thanks for holding me a little higher accountability." Because I do know leaders who, and I've asked this question. I said, "Do you ever get called out by your by your team for not living the core values?" No, absolutely not. They're my core values. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you might be, you might have a ni- different mirror than the one that I think might be more accurate for what's going on. So I, I do think yeah. it's if it's really core. You, and you're either gonna you're gonna need to hold yourself to a higher standard and get more yeah. out of your life by doing so because it is core and you're leveling up, or you might be yeah. justifying bad behavior. <laughs> and so you know, watch so out tough? for that. What's so tough is that there's people that have such low self awareness that they can't identify that they can't right. see it. You know they they have you know the the movie that's playing in their head is not reality. You know yeah. and so uh, that 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 can be very very tough for some people. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, you know, it's you know, continuing the theme, you know, not only do we try to equip our kids to go out and be productive, uh, you know, members of society and, and be good people and achieve, um, but we still have to kind of keep the, we still have to kind of keep the bumpers on from a distance, right? And, you know, and continue to to, to re- re- remind them what they're doing, why they're doing it. If they fall off the rails, you know, bump them back on, don't let them get all the way into the ditch before you intervene. Um, you know, and that's, that's not dissimilar to being a good leader, right? You know, as a good leader, we have to you know, equip our team to go out and, and start doing what they're doing. But we also have to make sure that we're doing some of that accountability to keep the, keep it between the lines. Because if you wait until it's in the ditch, you know, as, as you've experienced by getting your Jeep stuck, you know, once you're in the ditch, <laughs> once you're in the ditch, it's a whole hell of a lot harder to get it back on the road 
than it is to just bump it a little bit to keep it in between the lines. Yeah, so interesting. I, I think that ties into what Christy said here is you know, pr- pr- perfectionism is pr- procrastination in disguise. Mm. And I think that. Um, said from a recovering perfectionist. I like that. Yeah, so I, it is important to make make progress get out there and keep the momentum going and hold, be be accountable to reality be honest with what's working and try things uh you know the, the fear of imperfection the, the yeah they're both both sides of those it's justifying a complete disaster <laughs> and then there is also setting the bar so high we don't make any action yeah yeah yeah. What, what other, uh, what other rules did you, or not rules, but, uh, life lessons did you impart with your kids that, uh, or with your daughter that, uh, that, that, that seems to transcend, um, professionalism and, uh, and, and being a child? Well, the number one, without a doubt, uh, is you're the one who picks up the check. You're the one who is going to live with the outcomes. And so all of the shoulds, all of the things you hear from people, they've been good guidance, but now is your time to listen to your inner whisper and your inner voice. And you need to, to discover it, learn to uh, honor it. And, and you will not have a happy life if you're trying to please other people. You, you need to understand what really your journey is and what do you need. And really trying to coach her to get comfortable listening for it because it is so quiet, especially at that age. There's so many voices oh, yeah. in, in your head from dip parents and grandparents and school and teachers. Yeah. And it's like, what, you know, what is your journey? And negative self-talk and doubt yeah. and fear. Yeah. And yeah. 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 I mean, that's, that you're absolutely right. And, and, you know, one of the things we, we talk about as well is, you know, life isn't necessarily about finding yourself. It's about creating yourself, right? It's about, figuring out who you want to be and becoming that person. Um, you know, the, uh, the, my experience going from high school to college and, and what I, what I've shared with my daughter is that, you know, in, in high school, you know, she started in, in kindergarten with the kids that she went all the way through school with. Right. Mm-hmm. And so you're, you're pigeonholed, you're judged, you're branded, you're, you're labeled based on your entirety, right? If you had an awkward phase in seventh and eighth grade, then by God, that was going to define you through high school because the people that know you, that's, that's how they viewed you during those, during those formidable years when people were jockeying for, for hierarchy, right? The beautiful thing about going from high school to college is that now you get to redefine, right? And you get to be who you want to be. You know, you get to figure out, okay, this is the person I want to be. Now, how does that person behave? How how does that person believe? How does that person treat others? How does that person practice their beliefs? Um, And the same goes in, in the professional world, right? When you get a new job, when you go to a new company, you get to start over. You don't have the, you're not dragging the baggage with you. You get to start anew if you choose to. Mm-hmm. But yeah. you have to define. You have to decide who that who that person is that you want to be, and how does that person speak? How does that person behave? How does that person act and respond in adversity and yada yada? So, how do you uh, make the not to, I'm gonna say this and we'll unpack it. The difference between discovering who you are and creating mm-hmm. who you want to be. I believe there's yeah. an interplay between those, and I hear what you're saying. Like you know, it's a it's an a set of actions. Like if you yeah. don't take action, you're not going to yeah. get down the path. Yeah. But but you can't choose to be. I don't think just any old thing. <laughs> you 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 have to decide what that's going to look like based on who you are, what what your talents are, what your natural paths are, what your passions are. There is a discovery element to figuring out what you could be. And then you've got to make that could be a reality. And how, how do you see those fitting together? Yeah. So the, the difference I believe, you know, and, and I'm, I'm an amateur psychologist, so, so please don't, uh, don't take this as, as gospel, but I believe that if you wait to find yourself, you're going to be, you're going to be allowing a lot of external factors to define your path in life right? Because you're going to be a participant in life, just going through the motions, trying to wait for that sign to tell you who mm-hmm. you are, waiting for, waiting for something to occur to you to help you identify who you are versus you saying, 
that's where I want to end up. There's the roadmap to get there. And here are the things I need to be in control of to get there. Now, granted, every step might not go as you want, yeah. right? You know, you might slip off a step and fall over. You, you know, one step might get pulled out from under you. And so you have to be um, able and, and flexible enough to, to pivot and, and change course. But you have to happen to life. You can't let life happen to you. I love that. And so Jordan Peterson talks about having an aim, the importance of having an aim. And and that is it's not that the aim is so damn important. It's that you gotta have something to measure against. And you and once you have an aim and you and you you take an attempt, you make an attempt, it either works or it doesn't, or if it works a little or if it doesn't work a little, you figure out and you have now new information, which gives you an opportunity to reassess the value of the aim. <laughs> and so I I agree with that. And I would add to that that I think that one needs to aim a lot frequently. Mm -hmm. Like try and try and go, is this working? Am I learning? And the right direction and and it's switch that switch that up don't get married to an aim yeah. that might not work listen to what you're encountering and, and make a change and continue yeah. to engage and and i think the, the the data on career satisfaction seems to be pretty clear that you cannot read about careers and understand what the hell these jobs are. The only way to really figure out the love of these different jobs of it, being an economist, being a scientist, being a doctor, being you know, whatever, it's really, really, really hard to have any sense of what that job is actually like until you actually try it. Yeah. And so the, the people who get the best careers are the ones who iterate quickly and they try things and they try the next job and then they, and they follow a path yeah. that changes frequently to get them yeah. into more actual experiences and exposures. So when they finally, you know, they've, they've had 18 different job type things by the time they land at some place that you're just crushing it. Yeah. But you, but but for me, it's so important that that people don't allow external factors to overly influence who they are and how they perceive themselves and and what they're experiencing. You know, we, we've I've seen a lot of kids go off to school and say, you know, I didn't like it at such and such school. It sucked there. You know, and you know, I think I shared with you before we launched today. My my biggest hope for my daughter is that she just has a wonderful experience, right? Because if she ex if she goes to University of Texas and she goes, oh, I just didn't like it there. That concerns me because that's her, right? Mm -hmm. If you go mm -hmm. if you go off to school and you say it's you know I went to you know I went to A and M and it sucked. No, it didn't suck. You sucked. And I don't mean that literally, but I mean that if, if, if you go someplace that has a long history of people having an amazing time and people doing wonderful things mm -hmm. and having great success and you had a bad experience there, that's more on you than it is on that place. You either, you either got sucked into a rut, you, you aligned yourself with bad people that drug you down, you didn't put yourself out there, you didn't go exploring, but... If, if you recoil from an experience, you have to ask yourself, was it me or was it was it the experience? Well, I, see, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in the specifics of that language. That And so this is, I don't, you know, somebody says, that song sucks. I didn't <laughs> like that song. I, I didn't like that song. That's yeah. true. That's true. Yeah. So I did I not have like a good, I didn't have yeah. a great experience at that school. I couldn't figure out how to get anything out of it. I don't know why people enjoy it. I did not. Those are all true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yes. the, the school was not broken. I yes. couldn't figure it out. It didn't work for me. I wasn't the right fit. I needed to make a being, new choice. But that's being introspective, right? Yeah, for sure. Because that if 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 I if I'm saying I didn't enjoy it, I didn't find my place, right. I and at least you're being self aware that it was caused by your experience and not the facility, not the not the institution. Right, right. And, and it's blame. It's an absolute blame thing. You cannot blame, blame the world if you, to the you extent, and that, blame. and that's the, the the locus of control is the concept there. Do you believe that there's an external locus of control? It means things happen yeah. to you, and if you're lucky, you're lucky, and if you're unlucky, you're yeah. unlucky. It, the internal right. locus of control is, I have the power to make yeah. this do something. And actually, that kind of ties into what my friend Scott. I haven't seen Scott in forever, but he, um, I'm. Hope you're doing well, man. We should reconnect. But uh, he talks about telling his kids uh, what ideals they admire and make the decisions support those ideas and keep going back into that. So that's the Great introspection. Job, you, yeah. You've got to have the formula inside. And it's, you know, it's it's an iterative process. You'll build your, your entire life. What do you value most? And and yeah. you test those theories out. And you, I think I value this. And let me go try it. And then, actually, I don't value that as much as I thought I did. Well, well you know, what's funny is, is we were riding up the elevator 
um, on Saturday evening. We had moved in and we were going grocery shopping and stuff right up the elevator. And this young girl was in the elevator with us. And it was my wife, myself, my daughter, and this other girl. And she was like, yeah, I just moved here from Jersey. I don't know anybody. And I was like, oh, wow, Jersey, that's a big move. Why Texas? And she was like, well, you know, I just, you know, I just really want to do something different. So now I'm here. And she and my daughter chatted for a brief moment and they're like, okay, we'll see you around. And then they, you know, she got up my, we got off on our floor and she rode the elevator up. I said, I said, Kennedy, you should have asked her what room she was in. And then you could have swung by later, knocked on the door and been like, Hey, you know, I saw you in the elevator, you know, want to go grab coffee or something. She's like, dad, that's weird. And I was like, <laughs> why, why is that weird? And she goes, because you know, we don't want just random people knocking on the door. And I was like, I understand based on your current perspective and your current experiences, that seems odd. But in college, you know, you're going to be living in this dorm with, you know, you know, 600 girls. Um, at some point, you're probably going to have where your door just stays open and people come and go. Right. And, you know, I was like, so but but, you know, like if you ever have a moment where you're lonely, prop the door open, sit on your couch with your computer and just do some work sitting right next to the door with your door open. And somebody will walk by and say, hey, what's up? Yeah. You know, just, you know, get comfortable putting yourself out there. But also be that person that tries to connect, right? Be that person who tries to bring other people in who maybe are who are struggling or or, or, or who, who haven't found a, a friend group yet, um, because that's that's the environment you're in. You know, you know, know who you are and know how to create that that connectivity. I love this, and, and to tie this back to leadership, you know, if you're building a business, you you are going to do your best. You've had some, it's, uh, to figure out what the culture is supposed to be about and what you're after. What I've discovered, though, is it's not a light switch. You don't just design the culture, especially if you've already got 30, 40, 50 people, 100, you know, 400 people in your company. If you've got 400 people, the culture has a certain mass to it. But uh, every business I've ever worked, especially on the leadership team, they, they get good by iterating. You, you, you put a stake in the ground of what matters to you. And it's a hypothesis. And you bring people into it and you see what works. You open the door. You open the door, let people walk in, and you see, and you and you and you do your best to figure out whether you feel this is working or not, and you give it a shot. And in some of these people, it doesn't work. It doesn't work out, and you say, "Cool, maybe I'll catch you for coffee later <laughs> at another yeah. job, another business." Yeah. Uh, and then you sort of collect that group, and you get yeah. better and better at figuring out how to do that. So, like my daughter had an interesting example. She's learning to rock climb. And she's been saying all the things you're talking about, but then COVID has really made things hard because interaction is so much lower. And so she's not trying to figure out about how to open that door back up. And so, you know, she got really excited about like, hey, I met a new climbing buddy who is a petroleum engineer. <laughs> and it's so like there's this new connection of what matters most. That's it's a totally random connection. Like there's no way she would have made that. But she made this connection on something that was very important to her. And she pushed through her discomfort with maybe meeting somebody very much like you said. And she's like, cool, I've got a, right. I've got a buddy now. Yeah. See, now she's got a handful of rules, more and more rules that matter to her of, of common ground of like, let's connect on this. This actually is important to me. Nice. All right. So we're going to wrap it there because that, that puts us at our time. I do have to give a quick shout out to Hannah because one thing that we realized as we were moving our daughter to college was that we forgot to get kenneling for uh, our dog. So we, we couldn't find, uh, there was no room at the end for our dog. And so our neighbor, Hannah, uh, uh, stepped in and took care of our dog. So uh, I know she's, she watches sometimes. So I have to give her a shout out. Um, all right. So tie it up, Mark. You got 10 seconds. Go. Okay. So it's a, not about uh, the journey. It's not about the destination. It's about who's on the journey with you. Open the door and find those people with whom you'll have a wonderful, amazing, uh, important journey with. And uh, that's your community. We'll see you next time on Plan to Win with me, Mark Henderson Leary, and my good friend Brad. See you next time.